In part two of this series, I began with a long-recognized apparent contradiction between something Socrates says in his trial speech, namely, that he would never obey a command to stop philosophizing if the lawful authorities were to decree it, and his unequivocal agreement with the speech of the personified laws of Athens, which, amongst other things, solemnly proclaim that all laws and lawful commands are binding. And the only exception to this is the situation which may arise where the commands of the polis are in conflict with the commands of God. Curiously, no explicit argument is presented to secure the conclusion that, in cases of conflict between the two kinds of laws and commands, human and divine, the divine command supersedes the human. Well, there is no reason to present such an argument, as it was implicitly affirmed by every one of Socrates' contemporaries. More than just that, the truth of this principle is evident when one simply understands the terms involved. Not only every 5th century BC Athenian, but indeed every theistic believer as such, affirms that man is subordinate to the divine, and, in this case, the very survival of the city depends on honouring the gods correctly. It follows that no human command could ever take precedence over a divine command in those cases where a conflict emerges between the two. Now Socrates' defence of his very public pursuit of philosophy rests on the claim that it is a mission, moreover a mission commanded by the god himself. This claim is controversial as it rests on an inference Socrates draws once he successfully interprets the Delphic oracle that says about Socrates, quote, that there was none wiser. For present purposes, I want to skirt around any scholarly disputes on this precise point and just assume that the practice of philosophy is divinely commanded, just as he claims. At the very least, Socrates himself is convinced of this and the reasons he gives are compelling, especially in view of the pervasive spirit of Delphi that runs throughout the text of the Apology, not just in the recounting of the story of how Chirophon went to the oracle at Delphi with his question about Socrates. The only explicit divine command that is a key to interpreting Socrates' claim is not mentioned in the text, that is, the most important of all the divine commands inscribed in stone at the temple of Apollo in Delphi, that is, Gnothi Sauton, or Know Thyself. It hardly requires Plato mentioning this in the text, as it would have been extremely familiar to everyone concerned, including all of Plato's ancient readers. It is a little puzzling as to why, in his trial, Socrates did not fully draw this connection between the universally familiar Delphic imperative to self-knowledge and his own philosophic quest to interpret the meaning of the oracle that was about him. Now, what I really want to talk about here is this tension between divine and human command, and the kind of conflict that emerges if the two are at variance. While this issue first emerges at this time as a theme of discussion, it touches on a very real problem which will always be with us whenever human beings make laws. Consider these words from Martin Luther King Jr. in his 1963 letter from Birmingham Jail. He says, Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954, outlawing segregation in the public schools, at first glance it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law, or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. End quote. King's principles stated here sounds very close to some of the things Socrates says in the Crito and in the Apology. Indeed, the sentence, one has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws, could read as a very concise summary of the central argument presented in the speech of the personified laws of Athens in the Crito, the argument about the binding nature of law as such. 
He argues that while just laws are binding both legally and morally, what he calls an unjust law is not binding and therefore civil disobedience towards such laws is morally justified and lawful. Socrates puts it somewhat differently though. Where King talks about unjust laws, Socrates only speaks about possible human laws or commands that conflict with divine laws. Socrates' reservations seem more restricted than those of King. And so another point of difference with King would be this. The only example we have of Socrates justifying civil disobedience is in the practice of philosophy, and this because he holds that philosophy is a human activity that is, by implication, divinely commanded. For he argues that it is the best known means by which a human being can most effectively follow the divine command to self-knowledge. Philosophy is the specific means by which human beings can realize that command. In a later series I will take up this theme of self-knowledge and trace its development whereby this imperative is absorbed into Christianity by the Church Fathers. The theme of self-knowledge is also present in the Bible. Now, what we can say with some confidence is that Socrates presents an argument which amounts to asserting that the jurisdiction of the laws and commands of the city do not extend over the practice of philosophy. Philosophy stands outside the jurisdiction of any and all human institutions. This is because philosophy is implicitly commanded by the God when he commands that humans must practice self-knowledge. But there is a deeper reason which could not be easily explicated in the context of a court case, that is, a philosophical argument for the sovereignty of philosophy. Before addressing this question, I want to go on a digression to fill in some important background to a certain philosophical scepticism about popular religion at that time. Now, we must closely bear in mind that Socrates is addressing a large and representative sample of the active Athenian citizenry. After all, juries in such cases numbered 501. All this talk about Delphi, oracles, and the commands of the god Apollo may satisfy the comprehension of his non-philosopher contemporaries, the great majority, but it cannot be the case that Socrates himself understands the underlying issues in exactly these terms, that is, literally. His own self-understanding of what is at stake would be practically incommunicable to such an audience. The entire discursive framework, let's call it the Delphic framing, relies on the use of popular religious images and motifs which are immediately apprehensible to people shaped by that world view. We know that from at least the time of Xenophanes, the nascent philosophers, the so-called pre-Socratics, were questioning the images, stories and cultic practices of popular or official religion, but at the same time were not arguing for atheism. In fact, they were men of genuine piety, developing the foundations of natural theology. Xenophanes, who lived between around 570 BC to perhaps around 478, dating here is inexact, uh, that is over a century before the trial of Socrates, he conducted a theistic critique of Greek polytheism. Like all pre-Socratic thinkers, none of his texts survive intact, so we have recourse to gather up fragmentary quotes from later authors. He criticized the anthropomorphizing tendencies of polytheism, he rebuked the poets, naming Homer and Hesiod directly, for speaking such falsehoods about divine matters, and seems to be moving in a monotheistic direction. Here are some of the relevant fragments. 1. God is one, supreme among gods and men, and not like mortals in body or in mind. 2. The whole of God sees, the whole perceives, the whole hears. 3. But without effort he sets in motion all things by mind and thought. 4. But mortals suppose that the gods are born, as they themselves are, and that they wear man's clothing and have human voice and body. 5. But if cattle or lions had hands, so as to paint with their hands and produce works of art as men do, they would paint their gods and give them bodies in form like their own, horses like horses, cattle like cattle. And finally, Homer and Hesiod attributed to the gods all things which are disreputable and worthy of blame when done by men, and they told of them many lawless deeds, stealing, adultery, and deception of each other. From these sparse quotes, we can see that Xenophanes denies that the gods are like us, yet the poets depict them as 
something like superhumans, that if other species engaged in religion, they would depict the gods as just like themselves. He speaks of a supreme god over all others, and unlike them and us in body or mind, that God is omniscient, and that he has supreme causal powers which are mental in kind. In other words, God is omnipotent. Much of what he says here will be incorporated into later theological developments, notably by Plato and Aristotle. We also have reason to believe that Socrates would have been in agreement. For instance, in the short Socratic dialogue, the Euthyphro, we get a hint of this. The character Euthyphro has made great claims to being an expert on divine matters, as proved by his mastery of a great wealth of myths about the gods. Socrates is actually on his way to receive his indictment when this conversation takes place. Socrates is not impressed, as he says, quote, Well, Euthyphro, could this be the reason I am being prosecuted? Because whenever someone tells me stories of this kind about the gods, I accept them only with some reluctance. Because of this, it seems, someone may well declare that I am in error. So now, if you who understand such matters so well also approve of these stories, then it seems that I need to go along with them too. For what else can I say, I who accept that I know nothing about them? But tell me, in the name of friendship, do you believe in truth that these things happened in this way? Yes, Socrates, and there are stories even stranger than these that most people do not know about. So do you also believe that there really is a war between the gods, bitter enmities, battles, and lots of other things like these, as recounted by the poets? Are we to say that these are all true, Euthyphro? Not only that, Socrates, but as I said just now, I shall, if you like, relate lots of other stories to you about matters divine, which I know well you will be astonished to hear. I wouldn't be surprised, but you can recount these to me at your leisure on some other occasion. End quote. In other words, never. Clearly, Socrates has great difficulty affirming popular religious beliefs and practices, mainly the stories told about the gods by the great poets, which depict all sorts of unholy carry-on by the gods, such as those mentioned by Xenophanes and echoed later by Socrates in Plato's Republic, namely, quote, many lawless deeds stealing adultery and deception of each other, end quote. We can also adduce various other passages from dialogues which show that Socrates has uh, similar difficulties with popular religion and mythology. The second charge laid against Socrates was that of introducing new deities into the city. Now, despite the patent incoherence of this charge, as drawn out in the text of the Apology, there is nevertheless some grain of truth to it. It's not that he introduced new deities, it's rather that he challenged the dominant public perception of the divine, albeit in very subtle ways. Socrates was, in effect, agreeing with Xenophanes by saying something like, the gods are not what you think they are like. To those ill-equipped to think outside the box, to use a current expression, people of strictly conventional outlook, this would have been received as deeply disturbing and subversive. Socrates knows this, for he is acutely aware of his audience and their beliefs. He must convey the truth about himself, but in a language that his audience might understand. I'm thinking here primarily of his claim that philosophy is divinely commanded on the basis of an interpretation of the oracle about himself and the Apollonian command to self-knowledge. What can this mean? After all, Socrates did not receive a direct message from Apollo himself that he must practice philosophy. Rather, he infers this from both the Delphic imperative, not mentioned explicitly in the Apology, and his own interpretation of the oracle about himself, which involved an inquiry into himself, that is, into his own self-perception of not knowing, seemingly contradicted by the oracle's declaration that there is none wiser than Socrates. So what's really going on here? Now, at this stage, I'm not so concerned with his justification for the claim he offers the court that philosophy is divinely commanded. For present purposes, I'm assuming that it is. Let's grant this, that Socratic philosophy is divinely commanded. Here, though, I'm concerned with what all this means. What does it mean to say that philosophy is divinely commanded? For the answer to this question will considerably aid us in understanding why no human institution could have jurisdiction over it, and why Socrates' refusal to obey any future command 
to abstain from philosophy can be refused without contradicting his unequivocal agreement with the speech of the personified laws of Athens, which claim unconditional obedience to the laws. I'll begin with this principle. The laws of the city have absolute jurisdiction over all worldly affairs, but their jurisdiction does not extend to divine matters. Philosophy is divinely ordered, therefore philosophy does not fall under the jurisdiction of the laws of the city. Much later, and in very different times, it becomes a widely recognized principle that there are two jurisdictions, spiritual and temporal, one represented by the church and the other by the sovereign temporal ruler, which is the original meaning of the doctrine of separation of church and state. However, in the time of Socrates, this notion is still widely regarded with incomprehension and suspicion on account of its unfamiliarity, except among philosophers, as we noted with the earlier figure of Xenophanes. Yet, what Socrates represents in his defence is twofold. Firstly, his implicit claim that there are two jurisdictions, and that philosophy lies outside that of the city. But secondly, and this becomes enshrined as a principle of Roman jurisprudence, notably in the writings of Cicero, the greatest of Roman jurists, that human laws are null and void if they contradict divine or natural law. It is with Socrates that we see the very first stirrings of these twin principles. So, to summarise the issues presented here, the Delphic oracle pronounced that there was none wiser than Socrates, but Socrates has an acute self-awareness that he lacks knowledge. Socrates' self-understanding, taken together with the oracle, gives rise to an apparent contradiction. The apparent contradiction arises because the truth of the oracle must be beyond doubt because of its divine origin. This interpretation will be successfully completed when Socrates finds a solution which preserves both sides, that is to say, the truth of the oracle and the validity of his own self-understanding as someone who lacks knowledge. Socrates does resolve the inconsistency when he comes to the conclusion that he does. To doubt the truth of the oracle would be impious, but to be puzzled by it would not. As a matter of fact, all Delphic oracles were obscure in their meaning. The subject matter of the oracle is Socrates and his cognitive state, so the subject matter falls firmly into the domain of self-knowledge. The oracle appears to contradict Socrates' own self-understanding. Either the oracle is false, grossly impious, or Socrates lacked self-knowledge. Socrates does not immediately understand how his own perceived lack of knowledge can be consistent with the oracle about himself, that there is none wiser than Socrates. Socrates resolves the apparent contradiction by eventually discovering how his own acutely perceived lack of knowledge can be made consistent with the truth of the oracle. He only achieves this resolution through the public practice of philosophy. Socrates' resolution of the apparent contradiction results in self-knowledge, thus satisfying the Delphic imperative, know thyself. From all this, we can put together a formal argument of sorts, which goes something like this. 1. The Delphic imperative, know thyself, is a divine command. 2. Divine commands must be obeyed. 3. Obedience to divine commands is pleasing to God. 4. Philosophy aims at self-knowledge, therefore the practice of philosophy, insofar as it is obedient to the divine command to self-knowledge, is pleasing to God. 5. Divine law takes precedence over human law. 6. No human institution can prohibit the carrying out of divine commands, and no one would dispute this. Therefore, 7. Insofar as philosophy is motivated by obedience to divine command, philosophy lies outside the jurisdiction of human ordinances. Now, premises 1, 2, 3, and 5 were universally affirmed. 2 and 3 are also true by definition. But please note, 2 and 3 do not claim that there really are such things as divine commands. But 4 was unfamiliar, except to other philosophers at that time. Also, 4 reflects the ancient conception of philosophy, but does not necessarily describe the aims of contemporary academic philosophy. The conclusion 7 is true if 4 is true. Interestingly, the conclusion 7 is the remote origin of the principle of academic freedom, which is under ever-increasing threat these days. The proof for three is not dependent solely on the arguments presented by Socrates in the Apology. Before I conclude, 
I want to signal what I will need to address in the future arising out of these issues. 1. The philosophical critique of popular polytheistic religion, including the myths of the poets, and, beginning with pre-Socratics like Xenophanes and others, we ought to understand this trend as the first beginnings of natural theology. Natural theology is that branch of philosophy which investigates the existence of God and various truths about God which can be discovered through the natural faculties alone, that is, without recourse to something like divine revelation or traditional myth. 2. The origins of the doctrine of natural or divine law as distinct from positive or human law. These correspond to what Socrates refers to as divine law and the laws of the city, respectively. Via the Romans, natural law became the basis of Western juridical theory and practice until relatively recently. For instance, the natural law tradition still governed the juridical thought of Sir William Blackstone, 1723 to 1780, arguably the greatest and most influential jurist in the Anglo-Saxon tradition and author of the authoritative Commentary on the Laws of England in four volumes. And three, the deeper meaning of the claim by Socrates that the practice of philosophy is somehow divinely ordained. What does this mean, reframed in purely philosophical terms? This last item, number three, I'm going to take up in part four, and that will conclude this series. Now, I greatly appreciate interaction with viewers, as this reflects the dialogical nature of the philosophical enterprise itself. And this can be done through the comments section, which is very welcome. I'm also open to requests to cover certain topics, so long as it's something I feel competent to address. And you can do this through the comments section or directly by email, and for that see the About section. So, please like and subscribe, but for now, thank you for your attention.